Hey, hey there. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Tamara with Business Boldly. And like I told you guys yesterday, today I'm interviewing Les Evans. He's an international speaker, a business strategist, a Facebook marketer, an all around amazing rock star coach. And he agreed to meet with me and let me pick his brain a little bit and chat with him about some marketing, as well as how to kind of branch into starting your own business online and moving forward. Les, thank you so much for giving me some of your time today. Um, my my pleasure, absolutely. <laughs> I told a couple people about meeting you and about your journey when I was telling them that I was going to interview with you and how excited I was. So I first met you in Orlando at the JT Fox family reunion and got mm -hmm. to listen to you speak. And I've got to say, you're probably one of my very favorite speakers of the entire day. You're exceptionally enthusiastic when you speak and, <laughs> and passionate. And a lot of what they talked about and a lot of the speakers were talking about how to branch off and become a speaker and become mm -hmm. that personality and kind of own who you are. And yep. so I would love to know a little bit about kind of how you got into speaking, how you got into to your business model that you have now. Okay, sure. Well, again, thanks for having me on. And you know what? Um, to me, this is one of the fun things about the times we're in right now is connecting with people and sharing. And I, I love to share tips and hints and things like that. I'm more than happy to because I've gone through it. I've lived through it. I've done it. So um, the one thing about being a speaker, like a lot of people are, uh, you get two kinds of people. There's a lot of people who want to become speakers and there's a lot of people who are terrified <laughs> of becoming speakers. But the truth of the matter is, is anyone can become a speaker. And in fact, anyone I would suggest can become quite a good speaker, if not a great speaker, because it's totally a learned thing. And when you talk about sharing who you are, I, the words I use for that is uh, being a speaker is really just, if you're on stage or in front of the camera, for example, like this today, mm -hmm. it's more about um, showing the amplified best version of yourself. That's the best way I can say it, the amplified best version of yourself. Because as human beings, we all have our good sides and our bad sides. We all have flaws. Uh, but typically when we're on camera and we're on the stage, we're showing our best. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Because mm -hmm. there's, there's nothing wrong with showing your best side. And it's all about amplifying who you are on stage. to just a little bit bigger version of who you are on stage. Um, to use what you know to help empower people. So that's really exciting stuff. Now for me... I got, how I got into speaking was uh, kind of out of necessity. And if I go back, I'll just give you a quick rewind yeah. on my life. I mean, when I was young, like eight, nine, 10 years old, I wanted to be rich, famous, probably both, like a lot of people. <laughs> and I wanted to be a rock and roll star. Now, I didn't know what it took because that becoming a, a real rock star in any industry whether it's sports or, you know, take your pick, it requires inc incredible discipline and a lot of work, like a lot of practice. Right. Um, I was, I had a natural feel for music. So I started playing when I was very young, like eight, not eight, nine years old. And I played my first professional gig at 11, believe it or not. So, oh yeah. <laughs> I made $60 playing drums for a wedding band. And like when you're 11 years old, that was a lot of money, man. <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. um, and my father was a dance teacher. So I was, you know, comfortable with being on stage, but funny enough, one-on-one, -on -one, I was a very, very shy person, which is, <laughs> you'll see, well, yeah, you'll actually see that in a, a lot of uh, performers. They can get up on stage and not be afraid of the stage, but they can be very self-conscious. So it's more of, a self-esteem thing but to um to move that forward i started playing in bands and i was a professional musician professionally from age 16 to 27 so oh, wow. i my first entrepreneurial adventure was a working band so that's my real business i approach music as the music business not music free <laughs> so, right Oh, because, in, you know, in order to play for people, you have to create a commercial. I mean, like anybody can play music. That's a great thing today, especially the technology. Right. But to make a living at it, you have to produce commercially viable products, so to mm -hmm. speak, or performances, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but eventually get out of that because I damaged my vocal cords and I, I couldn't do it anymore. 
And to make a long story short, after going through some career as being a postal worker, if you can imagine, <laughs> for three or four years, um, I ended up wanting to become an entrepreneur because when I was working at the postal service, I, I was driving my posty truck one day delivering parcels and I walked into a, um, like a, what was it? A, a pharmacy just to get a Coca-Cola and there was a book on the shelf and it was called how to win friends and influence people. And being a young single guy at the time, I was like, Hey, cool. This is a book on how to talk to women. <laughs> Which which it wasn't, but it, the, I bought that book and it really opened my eyes. Like, so when you expand your mind, you don't go back to who you were. I saw this as a whole new thing. And it was like, oh my gosh, there's a whole world out there that I didn't know about. So I went crazy. You know, back then we didn't have the internet. It was called the library. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. So I went to the library and I cleaned the library out of every kind of success book, motivational recording, you know, and I went nuts with that stuff. And one day a friend of mine came to me and he said, you know, what are you doing working for the government? You like, you're, you're, you've got that entrepreneurial spirit. And he's like, I sell life insurance. So <laughs> like, why don't you join me? I'm making a hundred thousand a year. And this is 1985. That's a lot of money. That like is back, a lot of money. That was a ton of money. I mean, six figures, nothing to sneeze at. And so like an idiot, not knowing anything, I quit my job. And in six months, I was going broke. <laughs> like, because I didn't know how to sell. And this is the one thing I learned. There's no such thing as a born salesperson. This is very much a learned skill. And I, the company I was with had what they called the good luck training. It's like, here's your stuff. Good luck. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And so I was literally going broke and I came home one day and I was so frustrated, you know, there's nothing in the cupboards. And I took a box of macaroni and I threw it at the wall because I was so frustrated. There's nothing to eat, you know? <laughs> and that's when I started to look around for a coach or a mentor. But of course, back those like 1985, mm -hmm. 86, it, they didn't exist. Like you did today, business coaching, which is what I do today is very well known, but back then it was non-existent. Mm -hmm. So I asked around to everybody I knew and I got introduced to a gentleman and he was a door to door vacuum cleaner salesman, if you can imagine. Okay. And he had a reputation for being a good guy an honest. And when I met him, I was expecting, you know, bad breath and a terrible suit and tor terrible shoes. <laughs> and he was the exact opposite. He was a very elegant man, very intelligent. He was earning 120000 a year selling vacuums door to door. I mean, it was mind boggling. And so that oh, was wow. my first exposure. And I was like, I want to train with this guy. But he said, I can't help you out because I'm not selling them anymore. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going broke. Like, what am I going to do? And I begged him to teach me. Right. And so he, he said, give me a call and I'll call you in a couple of days. Because he goes, you're really serious. And I said, yeah. And so he came back to me and he said, you know what? If you're interested, I'll teach you how to sell. Well, we're going to sell pots and pans door to door. <laughs> right. Now, these were expensive pans made by a company in Dallas, Texas. They're still around called Salad Master. Okay. And if you know the name Zig Ziglar, I don't know if you know that. Yes. Okay. Zig Ziglar sold Salad Master pots and pans just like me. Oh, wow. Okay. So there's the I connection. I did not know that. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so he became a speaker and so did I, funny enough, that's just, there's that connection. But I learned um, this brilliant man, he was just a phenomenal gentleman, uh, trained me personally. And when I joined Salad Master, there was 2,500 people worldwide selling the products. And I was 2501. <laughs> like I couldn't sell. Like after six months, everybody told me I was nuts. You know, the family, they're like, what are you doing? Get a job. You can't sell. You know, it's <laughs> six months, you know. And in three months, I was number three in the company. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's the power of learning from not a teacher, but an actual doer. Right. You know, this, is, this is the distinction I want to make for people out there. If you're going to learn from something, someone online, because there's a lot of people teaching stuff, make sure they've actually done you know, what they teach, uh, because there's a big difference between the academics of say being a speaker or anything else for that matter. And then right. as you know, the real world application. 
for example. So he had taught me how to structure a presentation. And like I said, I was not afraid of being on stage, but to go into somebody's home and cook a dinner, because we had to demonstrate. Right. Okay. And the two hour presentation was nerve wracking for me. So it was frontline training, going door to door, knocking on doors, getting over that fear. And I learned that once you had the right scripts, that anyone could learn how to do this. And so, so that, to me. well, it would be, you know, when it was to me, it was to me too, Tamara, it was to me. But see, if you have somebody like he did, he guided me through. I was like, I don't know what to say at the door. I don't know what to do. He physically showed me, here's what to do. Here's what to do. When you go, he, every single step, he coached me through it. And it was unbelievable. And that's when I learned. And so subsequently, today, I do the same thing with people who don't know how to speak, don't know how to get on camera, are terrified. And I go, it's okay. I'm going to teach you the exact mindset you need because it's all your perception. Ugh. And I'll teach you the words and I'll teach you the structure. And if you follow this, you'll get the result. It's just like baking a cake. And so um, to go fast forward from there, around 2002, my brother was a really good online trading. Like today, people are really into online stock trading and stuff like that. Right. Back then, that was fairly new. And he wanted to start teaching what he was doing. And, uh, and I said, well, I'll help you out. And he's like, well, you don't know anything about trading. And I said, well, you don't know anything about selling. So, <laughs> so we partnered up together and we started teaching little classes, mini seminars, 10, 12 people. And I right. said, you know what? We're having success with this. Let's scale it up. Yeah. And we did. We started doing, and I'd learned how to do marketing. I'd studied copywriting. I trained myself in copywriting. I wrote newspaper ads. I wrote radio ads. We did all that stuff. We advertised. And to make a long story short, we ended up turning that into an investment company. We had customers. We went across Canada, then branched out into the United States. So I learned how to be a speaker because rather than, like if, like if you're in real estate or investments, for example, it's very time consuming to go see people one on one right? and do the same presentation over and over again. So I thought, well, if I can do the presentation in front of one or 10, why not a hundred or 200? <laughs> Just get it out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is the same thing. And so word got around and again, long story short, the biggest presentation I'd ever done at that point was in front of 1200 people at once. Oh, wow. That and I got, <laughs> yeah, well, it isn't though. It isn't because again, it's mindset, right? Once you, once you learn how, in fact, the bigger the crowds get, the more fun it gets to be. That's the <laughs> cool part. Cause my wife says, I don't know any, he goes, it's ridiculous. You get paid to, you know, goof off on stage. I'm like, yeah, that's, what, that's so, but that's, so I apologize for that kind of long winded oh, no, answer, fine. but that's how I got into that. So because I went through all those bumps that's why today I take, you know, clients who are not used to speaking and within, it takes realistically six to 12 months, but you can be good and really good in 12 months, not, not 15 years, 12 oh, wow. months. I mean, be really good. I would think it would take a lot longer than that. Nope. nope. And so now you and I talked a little bit earlier about how a lot more people are branching into this online space and are yep. trying to start their businesses and are trying to kind of make a way for themselves. And so to me, that seems really similar as if when you're doing your door to door sales, you're trying to get up close and personal. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of make that, that move to where you're going door to door to where you're talking to thousands of people? If, if you're looking at that as like an online space or comparison, say you're someone like me, you have a yep. couple hundred people you talk to that say, Hey, Tamara's pretty cool. How do I make that thousands? Okay. Well, I mean, it's all marketing, right? But let's, right. let's rewind back to the beginning. If I may, Yeah. Please. let's say you've never done an online business or never done an online course or something right. like that. Right. And it's like, Oh my God, what do I do? Cause this is, there's probably millions of people right now trying to figure that out. So the number one question you have to ask yourself in, in your business or in your life, because remember, just because you have a business, maybe you sell tires, for example. Right. Just say that. 
Okay. And maybe the tire shop closed. But there are other things you've done in your life or there's stuff you've learned in your tire business, as an example. And you simply ask yourself, what is the biggest transformation you've ever done for somebody else? What is the greatest miracle you've been able to create for someone else? It doesn't have to be in the tire business necessarily. Maybe it's maybe you're an avid fisherman on the side and that's your mm -hmm. side passion because you can teach stuff like that online, believe it or not. Nowadays, <laughs> mm -hmm. the sky's the limit, right? So the key is to not try and figure out what people want to buy, but what is the single greatest transformation you can provide for somebody? Right. Because, um, the, for example, there's a young fellow I met a, a couple years ago who wanted to be a speaker. He's a very smart guy, but he suffered from terrible, terrible anxiety. I mean, social anxiety so bad he got kicked out of kindergarten when he was age three. Wow. Um, he, f he was failing in his university. They kicked him out of university, even though he's, because he just couldn't handle being around people. He's very much, a, a, a introvert would be a kind word. <laughs> I mean, this is a guy who couldn't even, you know, say pass the turkey at Thanksgiving kind of thing. <laughs> just terrible, uh, social awkwardness. And I worked with him for a year and all we did, we did some, um, video calls like we're doing now, but a lot of it was just done like over the internet, over the phone, so to speak, VoIP. And I was able to get him on stage, international speaker. He spoke all over Asia, all over. Uh, we were on stage together because I worked with him as a coach. Wow. Did his first TED talk. He earned over six figures his first year as a professional speaker. Sold out all his seminars. And so that for me, as an example, is a great transformation. That's pretty dramatic but it doesn't have to be that dramatic. It's just, you know how we all love watching like makeover shows, right? right? Home makeovers, fashion makeovers, any kind of a makeover where you can tra uh, transport somebody from a before and after, that's where your business lies. Because it's a skill that you uniquely have that nobody can duplicate. And even though, think about this for a second, Tamara, even though you may be teaching the same thing as somebody else, mm -hmm. nobody teaches it your way. Does that make That's sense? True. <laughs> and I, I tripped, listen, I tripped over this by accident about six years ago when I was in Vancouver, British Columbia, kind of just north of where you're at, of course. Um, and I was speaking at a seminar and a, a young lady came up to me and she said, Les, I really um, fascinated by what you do, but she's like, I, how do I take my business online? And this is six, seven years ago. Right. I said, well, what do you do? She goes, I'm a clarinet player. She goes, like, <laughs> how do I monetize clarinet? And I was like, oh, boy. You know, I was like, I was like, oh, my. I said, okay. Oh, first of all, I said, well, are you any good? Because here's the thing. If you're gonna bring, well, sure. If you're going to bring a product or service to market, your internal, there's two things in business. There's what we call your internal reality, how good mm -hmm. you really are, warts and all. Okay? You right. don't have to be perfect, but you have to have a starting point. And then there's the external perception, which is how you market yourself and present yourself. Mm -hmm. And so you want to make sure that those are at the same level. You don't want to misrepresent. You, know, you don't want to underrepresent yourself either. Right. Right. You don't want to over exaggerate your achievements or accomplishments, but you don't want to underestimate. And this was her problem. So I asked her, I said, Michelle was her name. I said, are you any good? She goes, yeah, I play for the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. okay. Yeah. So you don't suck. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. And um, I said, the first thing you should do is charge more money because she was teaching at her home. She's a stay at home mom kind of thing. Okay. She goes, well, I do, you know, I don't want to change more because I'm, you know, it's super competitive. And I go, how many first chair clarinet players are there? <laughs> because one, I go, raise your rates. Right. Because that's the perception, right? Mm -hmm. You sell a Rolex watch for too low, people are going to go, what you talking mm -hmm. about, Willis? Right? So you know this as a marketing person. Mm -hmm. It's the price perception. And, and then she, she says, go ahead. I know that as a marketing person but just starting out and dealing with that self-confidence and that self-esteem of I'm going to charge $1,500 when nobody knows who I am and nobody knows what I do and nobody knows how I do it is terrifying. 
um, I got to admit, that's probably the biggest struggle that I have as, as a new business. Well, okay. Here's, here's the, the, just to address that since mm -hmm. you brought it up, it's a very good question. It's, it's not what you're charging. It's the value that you're delivering that makes the difference. So you're confusing, you're confusing cost with value delivered. Um, if you're working and you think about this for a second, okay. <clears throat> if you have the ability to deliver a return on investment for somebody, and, and that includes not only monetarily, but time-wise, mm -hmm. okay. How much is that worth? Like, think about the gentleman I worked with, and this is where I, I learned this lesson long ago. I spent 90 days with him working. He was training me. I mean, I was going off. We did t a dozen presentations together, and then he kicked me out on my own, and he would still coach me. But I was able to go from zero to number three in a company of 2,500 people in 90 days. Oof. That's because he took 28 years of experience and put it into 90 days. What's that worth? That's, right? That's true. That's you like, think about it. Now the gentleman that uh, coached that I coached this young fellow who's 24. Um, you know, I, I'm, ex I'm not a cheap coach, <laughs> but I get results uh, right. and huge results. So within a year, I mean, he already tripled what he invested with me and he's well on his way and we're business partners now. And now just a little bit, cause I know that you've been coaching now for a while mm -hmm. and, and you mentor and you talk to people Yep. So what exactly are you, if I wanted to work with you, what exactly would, would we coach on? Is it just public speaking? Do you coach business? Do you coach strategy? What, what exactly are you working on right now? Or could I get from you if I were to work with you? I've funny enough, you know, as narrow, like this is the problem when you're marketing with yourself to the marketplace, you have to be very, very pinpoint and specific. You don't want to be a jack of all trades. <laughs> You, you, from a market, so you, it's a two pronged question you're asking me. As far as my skill set, because I have so much broad experience, I've coached people on marketing, for example, and mm -hmm. I have a very specific skill set in that because there's many marketing facets, obviously. Right. I'm highly experienced as a professional speaker and I'm very good at teaching people how to do that and become great at it. Right. I'm also, I'd say the three biggest things are. A forte in marketing, well, actually four biggest things, speaking, uh, people skills, like soft skills, mm -hmm. really learning how to create teamwork and building culture in companies. I know how to build. Which is huge. Yeah. And I've done it very successfully. Culture is really, really cool because it, it's an investment of time. It's not an investment of capital. Right. But if you, if you do it right, oh my gosh, I've seen some of the companies I work with grew three, 400 percent in 18 months just oh, by wow. changing their culture. Yeah. It's, That's it's, it's amazing. It's one of my passions. I love it. Well, yeah. when people are motivated, they're motivated to work harder for you as well. When well, they're, when, when, they they're working, when they're working for their own reasons, yes. that's the key. And it's really about finding their greatness and celebrating their greatness and, and making sure the horse is running on a rice track instead of not swimming in a swimming pool kind of thing. <laughs> Right. That's true. Now yeah. you, you mentioned something that you have a unique skill set and that you teach some unique things with marketing. And mm -hmm. this was something I had wanted to bring up with you from a post that I saw on your Facebook page. And you were talking about something called neuromarketing. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of us marketers, it's tell your brand story, uh, you know, your content marketing, et cetera. And yep. you brought up the concept of neuromarketing and I have to say, I've honestly never heard of that until you mentioned it. And so I would love it if you could tell me a little bit about what neuromarketing is and why it's different and yep. why we're not hearing about it yet. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, the, the term sounds like really woo woo, like, woo, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, and it, it all comes down to um, neuromarketing comes from technology today. Because now we have MRIs, right? You know, MR, mm -hmm. magnetic resonance imaging. So we can map brain activity now, right. which was never possible before. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, I mean, you know, the biologists and scientists, they knew that we have, in the human brain, there's, we actually have three brains in one. So we okay. have the neocortex is the big, this mm -hmm. is the new brain, the newest brain. 
it's the stuff, it's the brain, it's the left brain part that does all the logical reasoning and it's very smart, but it's very slow. Um, it's very slow and it's very, it gets overwhelmed easily. So you throw a whole bunch of data at it and people just like start melting down. And then we have, of course, what we call the emotional brain. And that's where, like, I really come from that space being an artist. You very, that's your creative mm -hmm. side, but we all have that. Right. And then there's your primitive brain, which is kind of called the amygdala. Mm -hmm. And that's the fear-based fight or flight right. part of the brain, right? I mean, it's that most people know this stuff. But here's, here's what happens. So from a marketing standpoint, uh, for years, marketing was really kind of hit and miss. They thought it was science, but it was really guesswork. Because if you look at the way market research was done, right, you would have what? Surveys, mm -hmm. polls, consumer testing, focus groups, blah, 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 Pepsi challenge, <laughs> you know, all this stuff. Right. And it wasn't until they could do brain mapping and actually figure out what parts of the brain were firing that they realized that most of what we knew about marketing was wrong. The traditional advice was, well, you have to appeal to the logical part of the brain and you have to stir people's emotions. That's a traditional sales form. Right. Right. And you do have to do that. But what they found is it's the primitive brain that makes the decisions. And okay. the primitive, yeah. Now that's, this is ground shaking if you think about yeah, it. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought about that. Okay. The primitive brain makes decisions, but here's the problem. It makes them subconsciously. <laughs> So it's like, ugh, <laughs> great. So the question is in neuromarketing, this has been a science of how do we speak directly to the subconscious brain? Right. Even though this, the thinking brain needs facts, this part of the brain needs an emotional connection because we like and trust, blah, blah, blah. Right. But how do we speak to the primitive brain? And that's what neuromarketing really comes down to. It's like, it's so... Uh, without getting too complicated in it. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a, a, an example that was used years ago. They used Pepsi and Coke were bad. They're still battling it out. Right. But they had Pepsi did what they called the Pepsi challenge. So they were setting up these stands and you could go blindfold and sample Coca-Cola and sample Pepsi. Now Pepsi was winning because Pepsi is sweeter. Mm -hmm. Okay. So blind test, right. they, oh, it's sweeter. So people responded that way. And Coke mistakenly thought, oh my God, we're getting our butts kicked. We got to change our formula. And so they came out with a product back in those days called the new Coke based on this research. Right. Well, it was a flop. Ugh. It was a flop because when they finally got around to neuroscience and they could wire people's brains, see Coca-Cola had way better brand recognition, like from the visual standpoint. Right. And they would, sh when they would flash the Pepsi image and flash the Coke image, the Coke image lit up the brain like crazy, whereas <laughs> Pepsi didn't. So all Coke had to do was keep doing what they were doing and ignore Pepsi. Right. You see how powerful that is? So in real simple terms, and this is why I, I was going about a transformation. One of the things the primitive brain really loves is before and afters mm -hmm. black and white, you know, before and after it really likes things like that. It really likes pictures a lot. Okay. Um, visuals are really powerful and not stock photos. Stock photos bore the primitive brain. Well, that's handy to know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, here's why, because the primitive brain is constantly evaluating. This is all it does. Are you a friend? or an enemy? Do I need to pay attention or can I ignore this? Mm -hmm. That's what the primitive brain does. And it's very quick. It can assess threats. Like you see somebody smiling at you, probably a friend. They're frowning, probably an enemy. <laughs> so uh, when it comes to marketing, unusual images, like if you, cause you've done Facebook marketing, mm -hmm. it's the strangest, weirdest, uh, you know, that clickbait kind of imagery. Right. That's what grabs people. That's why people use it, because that appeals to the primitive brain. Okay. Does that make sense? It so, does. Yeah. So there's more things in there, but it, it, it's, really, it's really just it's about simplifying. And the reason that's so important right now is the more emotionally stressed people are, the less they need to think. Like this mm -hmm. brain cannot think. And if you know, and this is here's a weird stat. Did you know that people are scrolling through their phones, like on social media, okay? 
they scroll, scroll the height of the Empire State Building every day. I had read something like that, that it was yeah. some obscene amount. Yeah. So the more direct, the more simplified your message is, the better. That's why if you're going to be a business person, you want to get your marketing message down to very specific thing. Not you, you want to try to appeal to a whole bunch of people. So I can work with people in four different areas, mm -hmm. but as a marketer right now, I focus on, I can help you fill up your seminars or sell out your webinars and turn you into an amazing speaker in 12 months or less. And that was, you and I talked a little bit about that earlier. So that that's your newest program, right? Your, your yep. sold out seminars and webinars. Yep. Yep. And so if I were to come into that, it would be okay. Well, I want to teach people about, I don't know, brand consistency. Let's say that that's what I want to teach. So then you and I would work together and you would help me develop that. Right. But we would get even more specific. So while we're on the subject, let's just dig a little into this. Okay. Okay. So it's like brand consistency. We need to, for the primitive brain, we need to explain what that means in plain English. But let's even back okay. up further, okay? It's, um, we need to say, who specifically am I going to teach this to? Okay, now I've, listen, I have learned a lot of this from many other people. So I'm not the foremost guy. I've just, <laughs> I surround myself with some pretty brilliant people. So when you get a marketing message, and I'll give you an example. There was, um, I heard uh, 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 an example from a friend of mine, a client of his, mm -hmm. who was a pastor who is helping people deal with addictions, gambling addictions, alcohol, sex addiction, you know, all these right. different things. And he, he's great at what he does, but he wasn't focused. Mm -hmm. So he was trying to help everybody with everything. Okay. Right. So he narrowed the message down to, I help men with sex addictions and get them cured in, you know, 90 days or less without having to go to group meetings and da 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 does that make sense quite a promise yeah <laughs> yeah but it's very specific and could right. he deliver yes he could absolutely deliver okay. so if you take so if you want to focus like i could focus on for example i have a client of mine who's a doctor he wants to become a professional speaker i could literally focus say i help because most doctors are very left brain they're not mm -hmm. inclined to performance to the stage mm -hmm. i help doctors become engaging gregarious speakers in 12 months or less without overcoming mind there's an actual formula i use for this right to help you get your message down so to back up just to, for a minute to the clarinet lady mm -hmm. i said why don't you teach clarinet to people online i help people who want to clear i help and her message we got it to like i help Beginners and intermediate clarinet players who have problems with their tongue, loose fingers, and blah, 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 improve within three months or less. Okay. And like she started up a YouTube channel and just got people to send in, you know, free lessons. She was doing free lessons. And mm -hmm. then people started to ask her, hey, do you have a course or something? And so she did that. And within 18 months, she had like 20,000 YouTube fans and well over ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month in recurring revenue off her courses. Wow. Yeah. For clarinet. That's crazy. For clarinet. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like this is what it. I'm saying. It you can take today, because I mean, you're not your small town. You're saying you live in a small town, nine thousand. Right. I live in a small city, hundred and twenty five thousand. This is the this is the world. There's a lot of clarinet players out there or closet clarinet <laughs> players. <laughs> right. So sure. it like it like it I've seen I mean, channels on t everything today. Like a lady came That's to me, she said, I don't know what I want to do. I, I don't, you know, I said, well, do you have a hobby? In fact, at the very event you were at, the, the, mm -hmm. we attended, I had a lady come up to me and she's like, Coach Les, I, you know, I want to do an online thing, but I don't know what to do. I said, well, what do you do? Well, I work for government. Well, what do you do in your spare time? What's your passion? Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you, get up? everybody's great at something. Mm -hmm. And she goes, well, I like crochet. I said, okay. She goes, do you know what that is? I go, yes. Everybody's <laughs> grandmother, you know. I go, why don't you, why don't you teach people how to do that? Oh, there's no appeal for that. I go, you want to bet? I went online, looked at some lady had a YouTube channel, three hundred thousand subscribers, crochet, oh, wow. and was selling, you know, all the because once you build an audience, right? And today, 
to segue into this, if you want a strategy today, it's build trust. Mm -hmm. Build trust. Take one thing you're really good at. So if you're talking about uh, your brand stuff, mm -hmm. we have to narrow that down very, very specifically. What is that? What, do you, what was the exact term you used? Brand? Oh, I said brand consistency. Okay. So what the so hell Helping is that? business owners to stay consistent in their marketing message. Okay. But what does that mean? Oh, good call. Okay. So, um, this is where you have to dig deep. It means I was going to that, say, that's, that's tricky. It, okay, so here's, here's something we learned from neural marketing. Okay, so let's dig deep. Well, let's do this right now, real time, right? Okay. Okay. You want to coach? Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> Get okay. all flutter. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Now, one thing we know for sure is when people are stressed, mm -hmm. and that's 90% of the time, <laughs> <laughs> they will always default to the best known brand, the most familiar brand. Right. Okay, so the primitive brain doesn't like unfamiliarity. It doesn't like uncertainty. It likes, mm -hmm. I, I know this, I trust this. Would you agree? Right. Okay. Yes. And the more stressed the buyer is, the more likely they're going to do that. And I always joke, it's kind of like, if I'm trying to get home from work and my wife sends me a text, pick up some rice. Okay, I go to the grocery store. What do I know for rice? Right. And you go to the grocery store, there's a zillion brands of rice long... Did you know, by the way, there's like 40,000 varieties of rice? There's a lot of rice. <laughs> yeah. But it, like, I'm the guy, if, if this is not my normal thing, although I do cook, I'm just using me as an example. Right. I'm going to default to the brand. I know if I'm in a hurry, I'm going to go uh, yeah. uh, Uncle Ben's. Yep. That's <laughs> okay. That's yep. what you do for your customers. There that's you what you do. It means they will choose you by default every single time. That's mm -hmm. what brand consistency is. It means right. when they're looking, you're going to be the first person that comes to their mind. That's what you do. First cur person that comes to their mind. How's right. that for, how's that for a statement? That's, that's powerful. And that's definitely you, more powerful than I provide brand consistency. Because remember your clients don't know. That's what you say. That's kind of an egocentric rather than client centric thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to send to the clients. When people are looking for a dentist, you will, if let's say you're working with dentists specifically, pick a target right. market. Because if you pick a specific demographic, Tamara, mm -hmm. you can expand outside of that. But right. as a business person, like Michelle, she's targeting clarinet players. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Saxophone players can learn from her too. Because that's, that's also true. a reed instrument. That that's true. That's so true. you pick on one demographic and you do one thing that you're absolutely the best at. And again, you don't have to be the best in the world, but I mean the best you that you can offer because only you know how to do it your way. Michelle teaches clarinet a very, very specific way. It's not the competition's way. It's not the right way. It's not the wrong way. It's my way. <laughs> and, and the beauty of that is when you do that, nobody can touch you. You're competition proof because who's good? They can't. <laughs> Does that make sense? So it's a, they're it's, not a you. <laughs> it's a formula. It's like, here's the right way, the wrong way, the competition's way. And then there's my way, <laughs> the way I do it. I like and, that. <laughs> and that's how you differentiate yourself. It's just like, I do it this way. Well, I've heard it can be done this way. Yeah, but that's how they do it. I do it this way. And I help dentists. If you're a dentist and somebody's looking for a dentist, you're going to be the first person they call. That's what I do. I love your your suggestion to niche down really, really specific, even to like a target person. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of us are hesitant to do that, especially in the beginning, because you don't want to cut yourself out of getting clients. Yeah. And so a lot of us, I think, are trying to make ourselves bigger than we need to. That's right. In and, in the beginnings. And and the unfortunate the, unfor the unfortunate reality of it, like I get what because I've made that mistake myself. <laughs> Learned it from experience. But it's when you get, I always say the more narrow the sphere, the stickier the net, which sounds like an odd okay. thing, but that's something. I but I like as, that. That sticks in my head. I like that. Yeah. The, the narrower the sphere, the stickier the net, and because then you can, and if you pick, again, a clientele to get back to charging what you're worth. So let's come full circle in this. Quite often, if, if there's a price issue, it's because you're not working with the right kind of client. Okay. Because if you're a busy, successful person, the one thing you have is money. The one thing you do not have is time. 
Yes. <laughs> I don't have to like, I don't have time. It's like I said, if people want to learn how to do a webinar and anybody can learn this, it's a scientific formula. It really is. Mm -hmm. And also stagecraft, learning how to speak, learning how to present, learning how to lo loosen up and really express yourself fully the way you can comfortably. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to be Robin Williams up there, <laughs> uh, although he's one of my favorites. But all of that can be learned, but you've got to work with the right person, mm -hmm. you know, and a person who's busy. Like most people, I know a lot of people are out there, and we talked about this just before, trying to learn how to build marketing funnels. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's, it's like this marketing that's going on right now is like, all you need is a funnel. Well, that's absurd. <laughs> what, what, what are you going to funnel through? You, <laughs> right. you have to know what product or service you can offer. And this is what we've discussed today. Mm -hmm. Product or service, what can you do in a transformational way? And right. you, one of your fortes is helping people turn their intellectual property into a course. So that's now true. we've created it. So that's a very useful skill. So you can help people do that. I help people because that's not what I do. But you take somebody, you help them turn their, their clarinet playing intelligence or crochet into a course. And right. they're out there. And the one distinction I want to make, just going a little bit deeper, yeah. is not to just sell information, but to sell a result. Mm -hmm. Sell a result. Like, don't teach people how to clarin play clarinet. I'm going to get you to your first performance. Right. That's a different story. Mm -hmm. see? Well, because everyone wants results. That's the whole reason we do everything. Yeah. If you, you want, market, you know, well, if you, you want buy something. If you want information, you can go to uh, Udemy for 15 bucks and get a course. <laughs> That's but if true. you if you want to land your first TEDx talk or TED talk and you want to make six figures in your first year as a speaker, then you come to somebody like me. Right. And a professional who's busy, who's serious, who wants to do that is willing to invest the money because they don't have the time. And when you charge more money, think about this for a second, you can afford to give them the attention they deserve. Right. You because know. you don't have to work with as many people to make the ends meet. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, exactly. And your resources, right? For sure. I mean, people have, there's too much of that cheapness mentality out there. I, I can't turn somebody into a, like a six figure speaker for a couple hundred bucks. Right. That's, that's not realistic. So I, look, I can help a lot of people, but for me to really deliver the results, I have to talk to the right person. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of them out there. There's well, and that seems to be kind of something I've heard a lot is you have to be willing to invest in yourself, not just the time, but the resources, the money, the, the crafting that goes into it. And if you're not willing to invest in yourself, then you're not taking it seriously. And you're not, yep. you know, putting everything that you should be into it. And so do you ever feel like, people come to you and it, it would just be a waste of time for you to try because they're not serious about it. Yeah. I've always been curious about that with coaching because I'm not a coach. And so it's well, you know, something this is, this is um, I learned a really valuable lesson. I have, it's actually right up there. <laughs> I have um, a very special songwriting combination by David Foster, who's 17 time Grammy award winner. 42 nominations in the eighties. He, you name any major hit. It was him, Michael Jackson, take your pick. I mean, the only guy who has more Grammy awards than him is Quincy Jones. Put it that uh, way. Okay. Yeah. So he's, he's a fellow Canadian, funny enough. And um, being in the music industry at that time, I got to meet him and I had a private, it was like a mastermind, 20 people. Oh, wow. I and mean, this was unreal. Like, like that's intense. if you're in the music business, this is a big deal. And he said something to me that he'd learned from Quincy Jones, which was, um, like, if you're going to do your work, you always put out your best work. Right. I was like, okay, well, great. But I asked him a question. I said, listen, I know you're an amazing writer, an amazing producer, and a composer, and all this stuff. But I was like, how did you get so many hits? Because, I mean, you look them up. <laughs> it's, it's insane how many hits this guy has. And he said, it's really simple. He goes, I only work with artists I can create a hit with. And I went, ah, he goes, yeah, you, listen, you can have a great artist, great producer, but are they great together? Right. There's the magic. So when I got recruited into the organization at that time to become a coach, 
I kind of frustrated them because I was turning people down. Oh, okay. Because I'd never been a business coach. I love a business experience. I'd never been a business coach. So my theory was, if I'm going to do this, I got to go all the way in. <laughs> and I want to build a track record of hit records like that. Right. Get yeah. the gold on the wall, right? Makes How do sense. I do that? I work with clients who I know are going to be successful with <laughs> my help. And the ones that, it, like, if I don't have the skill set, I won't work with that person. If I can't deliver an amazing transformational result, I'm not going to work with the person. Not because I don't like them, maybe personally. Mm -hmm. Professional thing. It's like, um, that is the whole key, is to pick and choose your clients carefully. Right. So that you can, like, just don't take on anybody. You take on the ones that you know that you, you, your specific skill set, you know in your heart and soul and up here that you can absolutely help this person. You're like, you just know. And if conversely, you go, oh, I can't help. There's no way I can know. Mm -hmm. You can't take the money. It's just wrong. Right. And so that's how I created this reputation. And that's how I climbed to the top of the speaking world as well. I mean, I was a very successful platform speaker 15 years ago. And then I went to new heights after that because I was so fussy to pick and choose the people I would work with to get the result and perform at the highest level. And when your reputation is based on delivering great results for people, that just, the cream rises to the top naturally. And that's right. something that anybody can do. I mean, there's nothing special <laughs> about me particularly. It's just, these are the strategies that I've used. Yeah. Well, I disagree. I've, I've heard you speak. You are very special. You're very charismatic. You're an exceptionally dynamic speaker. So there is something special about you. But that's not to say there's not something special about other people as well. Just don't put yourself down. You are a very exceptional individual. <laughs> well, no, what I, I'm not, I think I appreciate that. I'm not trying to put myself down. What I'm trying to illustrate is um, I fully express myself. Right. And that is something that any of us can do. It's sadly, very few people get to the point or they're too afraid or they don't have uh, you know, somebody like myself, because I certainly had people along the way encourage me, you know, and I learned from a lot of different people, but can somebody do it? Yeah, because you've all had, like, if you've have even had a single moment in your life where you've been a drama queen, <laughs> you can do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, I am an excellent drama queen, so I've apparently just not well, pushed myself far enough. Well, listen, in, in our family, I am the drama queen. My, my wife is the calm one. <laughs> so. I'm, I'm definitely the drama queen in my family, for real. But now, it's, uh, yeah. we go. were talking a little bit about drama, and it made me think, so I've been following you on your Facebook and, and whatnot for years now. And you recently battled with skin cancer yeah. and, you know, you were very gracious in kind of sharing your journey with everyone and in saying, this is what's happening and this is what's going on. But during your entire time, you were always so um, uplifting and motivational and kind of empowering, even as you're going through this absolutely crazy struggle and, you know, some big, scary stuff. Throughout that process, how did you kind of maintain that attitude and that, um, I don't know, sense of calm and presence that you, that you had? <laughs> it was calm on camera. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that's got to be hard to maintain that well, level of public figure. You know, here's the thing. I never, um, first of all, I had... Um, basal cell carcinoma, which thank God is not life-threatening. But it was, um, it was, I had a patch on my nose and it started years ago and it, it was growing and growing. And I was at, um, at, a, at a home meeting some friends and there's a plastic surgeon friend of mine, Dr. Kong. And he said, let's come here. Let me take a look at you for a second. I was like, what is that? He goes, I don't want to alarm you, but you need, I don't think it's life-threatening, but you need to get this looked at. And unfortunately, by the time I got in to see the dermatologist and get all the tests done and they're like, they confirmed it was very deep and quite mm -hmm. widespread. So they had to remove about the size of a quarter. Oh, wow. And fairly, and about the thickness of a quarter too, in terms of skin. 
remove it from my nose. And the sur I had an excellent surgeon, uh, just excellent. And he did a specific surgery called Mohs surgery. So they, what they do is they remove tissue and they biopsy as you go. So I was in the oh. operating room five out of 10 hours and a whole day at the hospital. Oh. So you have to go back in, they remove tissue back and forth, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But um, he said, we have two choices. We can take a you know, patch of skin and graft it, but he goes, you're gonna have a real noticeable gap there. Mm -hmm. Or we wanna do what's called flap surgery, which means we have to cut a piece of your forehead here and mm -hmm. peel a strip down, turn it backwards, sew it onto your nose, and it's gonna be live tissue removed from here right. down to here. And I said, well, if that's what it's going to take to get a bit better result, because it has it's living tissue with blood flow, right? Right. And I said, so that, you know, they literally, you know, split, split me open here, put it down, and they like pulled all this together, which I'm kind of going to joke about this a little bit, because it did, it, you know, got rid of some of the wrinkles. It was like <laughs> a, a bit of a bona fide facelift, right? <laughs> one and way then, i guess <laughs> yeah so that was the procedure and like i mean it was painful but listen this is people go through cancer it's not life-threatening the the thing that threw me for a loop was the uh, i wasn't prepared for the emotional shock because right. it's your face right yeah and especially being out in the public well for anybody but then when you're on stage and i'm for not sure. an insecure person but i was now mm -hmm. it just it was something i didn't expect that shock and uh, right. But to make another funny part of it, the weirdest thing was because they peeled these, peeled the skin from here to here, the nerves got reversed. So if oh. I'd scratch around here, I'd feel it up here. And if I'd scratch around here to feel it up here, down here, <laughs> it, was, it was like backwards. It was weird. But I was like, thank goodness they didn't graft it from down here. <laughs> <laughs> so scratch true. your nose. I've got an itch down here. <laughs> so, so I kind of joke about that. But then... Um, the reason I wanted to turn into, first of all, I didn't want to play this out for drama. Right. Um, it's just something I didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, how can I, how can I use this? You know, not because I don't want to be the guy who's like, well, listen to my story so I can inspire you. I'm not, um, I, I'm not, I like motivational speakers, but I'm almost not a fan of that because I, I prefer people, to, how can I say, to learn from tools and skills. Mm -hmm. Like so I said, it's not talent, it's training. I do believe right. people have talent, but talent to me is your inborn passion. Mm -hmm. If you, I, it's just been like, I loved music, something I've recently returned to. Um, so if you have, if you have a passion for something, the hours fly by and that's how the training kicks in. That's why I say, right. like, if you want to be something bad enough and you get the right people around you, you can do it. I mean, the young fellow I'd work with, Ethan is a perfect example. He had all the drive and ambition. He just, he just had all the fears and he didn't know how. So we worked on all that stuff. And now the university that kicked him out, he's a professor at. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. So that's what I'm talking about, creating a real result for somebody. And so, you know, you can do that too. But I just wanted to use as sort of, so the first time I spoke actually when I got back on stage was in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. It was really apprehensive because like, yeah. you know, but um, luckily, you know, people could really see because I do have a dent here. It's really healed up well, thank goodness. Yeah, um, for sure. But the first time I was on stage, I waited till the very end of the day. And I said, oh, by the way, take a look. Because I said, you guys have fears. I want to know that you, I want you to know that I've just gone through this too. And that's yeah. really what I wanted to come from was a place of, I've been there. I've, in fact, I'm living through it right now. And um, just to connect with people on that level. I didn't want sympathy or, you know, because I, I went through, trust me, very emotional, difficult time. Oh yeah. And I had sure. some other health challenges too. Like my body, I was just, I was working so hard. My body just broke down from the stress. I oh, got yeah. vocal cord nodules, which I had to have looked at because I was worried they might be cancerous, blah, blah, blah. Thank God they were. But I, I now a proud owner of, you know, vocal cord nodules, which ironically <laughs> has made my voice better. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. So there's the story anyways. <laughs> I love it. So, 
what would you say is kind of next for you? I know you're doing the seminars. Um, I know you've returned to music. You had one of your songs on your page the other day, which was awesome. I loved yeah. that. Kind of what is what does the life look like for you? And I know for all of us, it's a little up in the air because we don't know when we're out of lockdown and we don't know what comes next. What's coming next for you? Well, I think, think it's 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 kind of what I was focusing on. I I love to help people with in areas that I can help them with. You know, if somebody has a real passion and they want to either become a speaker or they are a coach or whatever, or any entrepreneur that's trying to transition online, I just want to give them some guidance that way uh, from somebody who's done it and where to start and be very specific and how to do it. Because it, the, the greatest thing is if you're not an entrepreneur already and you, or you have a business, but you're like, well, how can I, what can I put online? Mm -hmm. Okay. Like I said, it doesn't have to be your core business. It doesn't have to be the tire business. Maybe you're good at something else. Most people are, you know, maybe you're into motorbikes and here's how to, <laughs> here's how to, you know, I'm a genius at accessorating my Harley, <laughs> whatever the case. Like I'm kidding. Cause it's such a huge market out there. Right. You can, you can practically market or sell anything. And so you just need to learn how to do that. And it's all boils down to, do you have the desire? Because if you don't, and that's the thing about having some integrity as a coach, if you don't, if you don't have the desire, you're not going to make it. Like I've worked with a couple of Olympic gold medalists and wow. it, what's, yeah, what, you know, what's really cool about that is when they, when I tell them what to do, they go, yes, coach. Like they don't argue. They're just <laughs> like, like, okay, yes. that's what the coach says. <laughs> so I, yeah, it's like, <laughs> Awesome. Well, I mean, I've learned during quarantine that I'm really good at mixing drinks. So I mean, yeah. just, <laughs> maybe a time for a profession change. I'm not like, sure. listen, you, man, I'm telling you, like, have you seen YouTube? Like people respond. <laughs> if, if it, again, if it's you, you see, it's, it's, <laughs> if you're your authentic self and that's what you're really good at, People have, like I said, Michelle with their clarinet thing. My gosh, I think she's up to 30, 35,000 subscribers. That is so crazy. And she's doing exactly what she loves to do. Because you just, because it's such a big world. I mean, people have uh, passions of every kind of, I mean, it's mind boggling. Like we, uh, my wife does, do you, get, do you have Kijiji where you're at? Do you know what that is? Kind of like a, it's kind of, well, we have it in Canada. It's kind of like a buy and sell, like eBay, sort of that kind of thing. Okay. It's one of these things. And so every year we always do spring cleaning and fall cleaning. We're not pack rats. We're the opposite. <laughs> so we, um, we donate a lot to like Goodwill and things like this, but there's other things we'll sell because we're like, eh, that's a bit too expensive to be given away. Right. Um, so we started stuff on Kijiji and uh, we had, you know, old stuff going through, I old equipment and it's like, we put it up there and like, you're interested in this? Like what? <laughs> it, it just blew me away. Some of the most obscure stuff you think, God, there's no way. Like my wife was putting, she goes like, I'm going to, she, she's the Kijiji master. She goes, I'm putting this up for sale. I go, that is 30 years old. Nobody's going to want that. <laughs> well, boy, was I ever wrong. Like people are into so much stuff <laughs> these days. You have no idea. How I feel when I look at eBay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the th I mean, the thing, but one man's garbage is another man's treasure, right? You know. <laughs> that's true. And that's there's another thing. Like, pff, we have we have a pretty nice little side income that comes off of that alone. Mm -hmm. That's really and, smart. A lot of people I know get into the online auctions. One of my girlfriends, that's what she does, and she'll find random things on garage sale. She cleans them up. She refurbishes them and resells them. And, and she yeah. just loves it. She makes a ton of money doing it. So well, yeah, <laughs> my, power to you, my wife used to work for um, a department store, uh, specifically Royal Dalton, China. Like the, she, she really knows that stuff, decorative <laughs> stuff. We go into Goodwill and she's like, oh, my God, there's a Denby teapot. It's <laughs> four bucks. Do you know what this is worth? She was like, worth $100. <laughs> Nice. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> yeah, like she she found like even one of the um uh, a cookware piece for Salad Master. She yeah. walked in there one day and it was this it's the salad chopper thing. They're very oh, expensive. Okay. They're like several hundred dollars. Yes. And she walks in there and it's like five bucks. Somebody had no clue what it was. And she's like, oh my God. And right then the power went out. 
the lights oh, went no. out and they said attention shoppers they were like while the power is out it's 50 percent off <laughs> she got two dollars and 50 cents <laughs> i come home and she's got like this dishcloth and she goes you'll never guess what i got to and i was like i have no idea <laughs> there's opportunity everywhere Awesome. I like that's that you my, brought it around to that about the opportunity. It's absolutely crazy what people can do nowadays. That and that's my point. Like it doesn't you don't have to necessarily sell a um physical product per se. Right. But you can take again, take your what makes your intellectual property you uh, sorry, unique and differentiates you is your specifically. It's your thing. It's your distinct methodology. Right. It's your it's your personality because that's what people buy. And the key is to get very specific as to who you're going to market that to. Like I said, if you're the Harley accessorator guy, you're not going to sell that to Honda <laughs> people, you know? That's true. <laughs> you just have to get very, very specific. But it's like the, the world, I mean, there's a huge world out there. And so much of this can be done online. That's the, I'm not saying that everything true. can. But a lot no, of stuff. No, but a whole can. lot of it can. <laughs> yeah, and I'll t I'll tell you some. If anybody's listening, who's um, in the coaching space, particularly if you're really into, uh, if you're a mindset person or a healer or a therapist or stuff like that, you are now at the right place at the right time, big time. Because, <laughs> and I'll I'll tell you why without going too high level. If you notice, because there's people have so much time right now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of really weird, ugly stuff spilling onto the internet. A lot of conspiracy theories, all sorts of stuff. And I'm not going to get into that. But here's the main thing. People are going to experience a bit of shock because they haven't been exposed to that. And there's political scandals, scandals with celebrities, scandals with financial da, 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 da. And you're going to see a real apocalypse of trust right now which is why people are going to need healers and coaches more than ever if you're in that space to help mm -hmm. people transition through that you know deal with because if you're confronted with a belief you believed in a celebrity for example and you've turned out they find out that they've got some really creepy stuff going on it's very damaging it's like finding out your father was a murderer or something like this for example right. there's this kind of stuff but just you know our belief in people if we lose that it's it's very damaging so uh, people who are in that space or now is your time now is your time to to get your message out there and help people and it's interesting because i've had some people that i've coached that are in that space they were struggling before their uptake and clientele right now is going through the roof yeah several of the people that i work with and that i support are in that healing space and they're launching new programs and such and getting a fair response to it yeah. not just because we have time but because like you said it's a scary place to be right now and people are yeah. looking for solace and looking yep. for healing solace healing way. and they're looking for a sense of certainty right and that's going back to to your question there tamara the primitive brain it likes certainty and stability it does <laughs> not like this unstable stuff so <laughs> It's you're you're in a really good spot to do a lot of good things, you know. Unfortunately, and I, listen, I'm to blame as much as a because sometimes that stuff to me as a business guy was a bit woo woo. Not to right. say that I didn't recognize it; it's just the way it was always presented. Yes, it, it's hard, and I get it because it's hard for somebody who's a healer because they're working more in that side of stuff, the emotional side. It's difficult to translate that into a result for somebody. Yeah, for That's, sure. That's a hard thing to explain, but you can do it. Like it can be done. And now you even have the business people's attention because they're like, Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, and people are because they're at home. They're confronting a lot of different things, guilt, shame. Did I do something wrong? You know, yeah. all the, all these different emotions without digging down the rabbit hole. <laughs> but we have to recognize, I'm talking about the effect of all that stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause I don't think anybody truly knows what the heck's exactly going on. You know, that's true. <laughs> I, I have theories and speculation, but <laughs> I think all, I think all of us do. Yeah. Well, I've taken a lot of your time and I really appreciate it. And I got so much out of this. If people watching wanted to work with you or connect with you or 
know more about neuromarketing, know more about doing Facebook advertising with you or coaching, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Um, probably for right now, just ping me on Facebook because okay. uh, you can put my link there or something, right? Yeah. That's the plan. Yeah. yeah just, just send me a PM. Um, I like to work with people I know, you know, Right. And it uh, doesn't mean like if I don't know you personally, but we can certainly talk and chat. It's, it's all about conversations. I mean, I love having conversations with people. The only way I can find if I can help somebody is to have a conversation. Right. And with, whether or not we work together or not just depends if that's viable or not. But either way, having a conversation, especially right now, mm-hmm. is a good thing. I think it's valuable. Like just because you don't have to, I don't think people should feel obligated. Like if they want to talk to me and ask me some questions, need some help, more than willing to help. Doesn't mean you're obligated to do anything, nor is it an obligation on my part, because it's more important that if we do work together, like I said, that fit has to be there. But having said that, I would hope that the people watching and listening can get some kind of benefit either way, wherever, whatever space you're in. So that's my wish. Yeah, and like I said, you know, I was really apprehensive reaching out to you because I've been following you for so long. Yeah, I, I don't know those... why. See, I think that's kind of funny, actually. I'm like, why wouldn't you? <laughs> well, you get like those sideline fans, and you're like, oh, it's this. <laughs> and so then you're like, oh, if I reach out to him, is he like too busy for me? And you've just been absolutely wonderful and personable. And I, I truly hope people do reach out to you and chit chat because I think you have so much to offer, and your story is just absolutely incredible, and and your journey is awesome to watch. So thank you for taking the time with me. Again, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put your link in the comments so that people can reach out and they can chit chat and touch base with you, become a fan, become a follower. <laughs> well, cool. I, yeah, I didn't, you know, I don't really think about it, about you know, <laughs> sideline fan. I don't really, th- I don't think that way. So, um, <laughs> but that's, 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 um, that's nice to hear. It's very flattering, but Aww. I'm glad to hear, I'm glad to hear it's making an impact. Because, you know, when you, when you put stuff out there, and then if I could tell you one thing, uh, because you kind of asked me about this before, yeah. you have to have the courage to put yourself out there and not worry about the result, you know, if, if, if you may. You kind of have to, I get a little emotional here. I'm getting kind of choked up. <laughs> I, I really, I'm like that. Um, you have to have the courage to put yourself out there and divorce mm-hmm. yourself from the result. And the people who are ready for that message will be ready, and those that aren't, they aren't, you can't worry about that, so. But it, right. it, it's a shame not to put it out there. That's one of the reasons I, I decided to put a recording, record some music. I hadn't done that in a long time. People had always said, did you, did you really do all this stuff? And I go, yeah. <laughs> They're like, well, it sounds like a fairy tale. Well, it's not. But it's, it's you know, <laughs> doing music because I do it the old way f- from scratch. I don't use um, samples and st- I did that recording <laughs> was all me. Like physically Your music playing. is really good. I appreciate you sharing it with us and, <laughs> and getting back into that. I think yeah. the world needs it. All the quarantine karaoke, I got to say I'm a fan. I've not been <laughs> taking it all in. <laughs> it's, well, doing music is hard. Like I, it's <laughs> like that recording I put on um, took me hours and hours and hours. There's probably 30 hours of work in there. Oh, like, wow. Well, it turned out great. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. But it's like some, you sometimes you tear your hair out. But that's just how. But you know what? That's I love that part of it because you know you're like this, you get to parts where it just sucks and you're like I just want to throw this out. My wife is like, don't throw it out, you know. So I just put it away, come back, and that's the creative process. You 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 gotta you know. That's I feel thing. that with video editing. I can't imagine doing it with an album <laughs> or with music. Yeah, well, David Foster only taught me there he was like yeah recording an album is like painting a 747 with a q-tip <laughs> <laughs> that's about the size of it too because it's it's like a ton of work <laughs> i've Especially never if, heard that but I like yeah it. well i thought it was a funny expression but it like any of the if you're listening to major artists the amount of work people have no idea how much work it takes it's like oh i, I can't imagine it's, it's hun- hundreds of hours of work, but that, that's what makes it great, you know, and that's, <laughs> that's what I love about the creative process. And that's the thing, you know, maybe on a final note, if you're going to do something for people, you want to, you want to, that's what I'm saying. You got to pick what you pick the result that you can transform people with, because that's where your passion's going to be. And if you're doing something where your passion's at, and part of it is not only doing what you love, but loving what you do. 
because there's parts of what you're going to do that you don't like. <laughs> you know, that's just how it is. Even as being as a coach, trust me, or a speaker, there's parts of it I don't like. But I do those things so I can do the parts that I do get to do. You know, <laughs> being on stage in front of a few thousand people is an absolute barn burning ball. It's fun. <laughs> I'll take your word on that one. It sounds terrifying, but you do it with ease. And so I'm, it looks like you're having a good time. And I love that about watching you speak. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you again for your time. I look forward to talking to you again. You've been absolutely wonderful. Again, you guys, if you want to reach out to Les, please do. As you can see, he doesn't bite. He's absolutely great nope. to talk to And I'm going to put his link in the comments for you. Thanks for checking out the video and I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day, you guys.